Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, that you are our rest. When everything is going crazy around us, where we have perilous times, we're steady, we're steady, seated, settled, and steady as she goes. And we thank you for that, Lord. And now, Father, I pray that you'd help us to rise above fear and uh, help me to conclude the series tonight. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. God's people said amen. amen. You ready to be aggressive receivers of the word tonight? Amen. Well, we've talked about the different kinds of fear. We've talked about what fear can do. We're going to talk about now how to attack your fear. How to attack your fear. And you're going to have to determine if you're going to have a biblical view of fear or a world view of fear. I wrote this when I was studying. There is a major difference between biblical principles dealing with fear and the 21st century self-help techniques. Biblical principles see fear as an enemy to be identified attacked and conquered self-help techniques see fear as an unwanted yet persistent lifelong companion to be understood and coped with now that's the difference between the world view and the word view if you talk to some people about, if you talk to even some professionals, and we thank God for all of the help that anybody can give people. But if you talk to some professionals, they will tell you, you're just going to, you have panic attacks. You're always going to have panic attacks. This is something in your DNA. You're going to have to learn to cope with it. You have anxiety. It's something in your DNA. You're going to have to learn to cope with it and learn to live with it. Well, the Bible refutes that concept. The Bible says God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love. Now watch this. And of a self controlled mind so I and God didn't say in Romans chapter 8 I will make you a coper he said I'll make you more than a conqueror and I believe God wants us to live strong above fear now that does not mean you're not going to have to deal with fear you wouldn't need faith if you didn't have to deal with fear whenever you hear the word cancer in a doctor's office, fear will try to attach itself. And you know, there's actually been studies that have proven that fear causes cancer to even metastasize sometimes seemingly at a faster rate. Now, I'm not a doctor and I don't understand all about that. But I know that fear has torments. So, we talked a lot about that. Now, we're going to talk about how do we attack fear. How by faith... Do we attack fear? Well, first of all, you're going to have to decide, do you want to conquer fear or do you want to cope with fear? That's what you're going to have to decide. And that decision is going to have to be yours. You say, well, Brother Mike, we can't. If that, if that doesn't matter. I can't just make a decision to do that. Oh, yeah. The power of a human choice is the greatest power next to God's power on the earth. Do you know the power of a human decision is the only power on earth that can say no to the will of God. Now, come on, think about that. We passed the... Man, we just skipped it all together tonight, didn't we? The, po the power of a human decision can say no to the will of God. Well, how do you know, Pastor? Because it's not God's will that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. But people reject His love every day. How do they do that? By the power of a decision. So here's my logic. If the power of my choice can say no to the will of God, then the power of my choice can say no to faith or to fear. It can say no to fear. My faith choice can say no to fear. Amen. Say that with me. My faith choice can say no to fear. Say it again. My faith choice 
can say no to fear. So now once you do that, we're going to attack it seven ways. Number one, attack fear by being full of fear. <laughs> attack fear by being full of fear. Now that statement sounds ridiculous at first, but really is a powerful truth. Be full of a healthy biblical fear of God and you will not need to fear man or Satan. There is a good fear. It's called the fear of God. And really the word fear, usually in the Old Testament, is talking about a fear of God, is the Hebrew word yare, and it means, it means a, a, um, a reverence in that sense and an honor in when it's used in a positive sense. When it's used in the negative, it's emotional, intellectual anticipation of what might go wrong. But a good, healthy, honor, reverence, fear of God will keep you out of the other kind of fear. I'm going to give you a lot of scripture. Psalm 33, 18 and 19. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that do what? Say it loud. That fear him. And upon them that hope in his mercy to deliver their souls from death and to keep them alive in famine. The eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him. Psalm 34, 7. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that, what? Fear him. And what do they do? Delivers them. The angel of the Lord in camp. And have you ever noticed that? Most of the time we quote that and say, the angels of the Lord. Well, the scripture says the angel of the Lord. Well, I believe there's more than one. But you know that one walked through Sennacherib's army and killed 185,000 warriors just by walking through while they were asleep. Well, if all you've got is one, you got a pretty good secret service detail. you got a pretty good secret service detail. The angel of the Lord encamps, encircles, surrounds those that fear him. Psalm 25, 14 talks about the fear of the Lord. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. This word uh, secret in the Hebrew is real interesting. It means to be sitting on a couch or a cushion as close covenant friends and sharing confidential information with each other and the liber and deliberating that should be and deliberating over a problem think about that god says if you'll have a good healthy fear of me if you'll honor me i'll just sit down on the couch with you come on think about this he said, uh, by my Holy Spirit, I'll just sit down on the couch with you, and we'll talk about this. And I'll give you some secrets about this. And the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. In other words, I, I'll, I'll give you some confidential information. I'll give you some private counsel. How many would like for the Holy Spirit to give you some private counsel right now? Well, what attracts that? It's a good, healthy fear and honor of the Lord. And can I just say this? I love my country. And those of you that know me know I love my country with all my heart. Pray for it every day. I, 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 I would live for it and I'd die for it so the next generation could preach this gospel. So I love my country. But my country has lost a healthy fear of God. We don't have a healthy fear of God. We don't have, and, and, and it does mean honor and respect, but it can also mean emotional, intellectual anticipation of harm. Now, I had a healthy love and fear of my earthly father, but I also had an intellectual and emotional anticipation of what might happen. Come on, somebody. I had, I had a proper fear of my father. It wasn't a negative fear. It was birthed in love. It was birthed in honor. But I did know whom my daddy loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son that he receiveth. 
My daddy knew that scripture. <laughs> I heard somebody say, so did mine. And I'm glad. I'm glad he did. And he never abused me. But, but I had a healthy fear. I, I see some of the things in our streets today, and people just don't have any fear of God. I see, um, and, and thank God we have a right to protest, and we have freedom of speech and all that. And I'm grateful that we have right for freedom of speech. But I watch some posters that are held up, and I won't even repeat them in here. And it'll have the worst words imaginable, and then it'll have Jesus on it. And uh, we've, that's because we've lost the fear of God. We've lost the fear of God. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Let me give you an add-on, not to add to the Scripture, but let me just give you a Mike Brown concept. The lack of the fear of the Lord is the beginning of stupid. And that's why you've got a lot of stupid going on today. Economically, geopolitically, in a lot of things, a lot of stuff. I don't know if you've noticed, but and I've I got to keep going tonight, but I don't know if you've noticed, but in this, um, and in, in this COVID era, era, it's amazing to me how it's so affected. And I don't mean biologically, but I mean psychologically, it has affected people's ability to do their job. Come on now, I'm not being judgmental. Come on, we're family now. Has anybody else noticed? I mean, I, 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 you're taking care of business, you're doing something, and this is their business. This is what they've done for years. But, but what you used to be able to say once, and they'd understand and do it, now you've got to say it three times. You, know, you have to work through it. Why? When there's an absence of the fear of the Lord. When there's an absence of the fear of the Lord. Society begins to debilitate. The church can debilitate. I, I'm shocked sometimes at what the church world. We've lost our fear of God, folks. I mean, I love God with all my heart. But He is God. He's not my racquetball buddy. He's not my golf partner. He's not just a buddy. He is the Almighty God. And He deserves honor. He deserves fear. Psalm 103, 11, For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is His mercy toward who? Them that fear Him. Psalm 103, 13, Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that, what? Fear him. Told you I'm giving you a lot of scripture. Psalm 103, verse 17, But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting, and upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children. And the last verse in this point. Psalm 147, 11. The Lord takes pleasure in them that fear him and in those that hope in his mercy. How many want God to be pleasured with you? You know, it's one thing for God to love you. It's another thing for him to like you. Come on. I mean, there's a difference between love and like. I've, I've taught that already here. You mean, well, yeah, he's no respecter of persons. No, he's a respecter of the fear of the Lord. He's a respecter of hope. He's a respecter of faith. He's a respecter of obedience. It's not, he's not a respecter of who. He's a respecter of what. And I can do things that'll pleasure him. Come on. I don't know about you, but I want the Lord to like me. I want him to like me. I don't want my angels to be asking for another assignment. I want them to be going to the throne and saying, could you put me with somebody else? You know, I, I, I want my angels to be pleased with me. I want God to be pleased with me. So I'm going to have a healthy fear of the Lord. Number two, attack fear by walking in intimacy with God. Attack fear by walking in intimacy with God. I've used this illustration several times before, but I'll bear it because it's, it's pertinent to where we are. Smith Wigglesworth was lying in bed one night. He was sound asleep, 
and he recorded in his journal and in his diary that Lucifer himself manifested physically at the foot of his bed and was staring at him and laughing at him. And Smith Wigglesworth, now I'm not talking about a used demon here. I'm talking about Lucifer, the son of the morning, Satan, the old dragon, serpent, okay? And he and said, so, well, how do you know that happened? Well, people that, you know, a, a person like Smith Wigglesworth that raised the dead over and over and over again, and uh, you read his journal and his life and integrity, I have a tendency to believe that man. And he said, Satan manifest right there at the foot of the bed was laughing at him. And uh, he woke up and saw him. And uh, you know what he did? I've told you before. He just, he just kind of rubbed his eyes and looked and said, oh, it's just you. And he turned over and went to sleep. Now, how in the world do you do that? Because you have such an intimate relationship with God that this guy that fell out of heaven as lightning doesn't scare you. Come on, anybody get a hold of that? It's kind of like um, when you were a little kid and if you thought, you know, there were monsters under your bed or something in your closet and the father or the mother would come in and be close to you. It didn't matter anymore. It didn't matter if the monster's under the bed or not. They better stay under the bed because daddy's sitting on my bed up in here. And if they come out, it was a intimacy with the father. Modern believers spend far too much time in the second half of James 4, 7. Resist the devil. And far too little time in the first half of James 4, 7. Submit yourself therefore to God. That's the verse. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Then resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Why could Wigglesworth resist Satan, and he disappeared from his room? Because he was so intimate with God. That's why we want you to learn how to walk with God, how to talk with God, how to enjoy his presence, how to laugh with him, how to cry to him. How do you enjoy his presence? I think Jesse Duplantis says it better than anybody I've ever said. I love Jesse. There's some people who don't like Jesse, and usually they're grumps. Have you ever noticed people that don't like some kind of preachers that they need that preacher the most? You know, people that don't like faith don't like Brother Copeland. Yeah, well, they need him. You know, I, I love Brother Copeland. I, there's all kinds of different streams. And, but the people that don't like Jesse don't. They're, I don't like joy. I don't like joy. Well, that's why God sent Jesse. You know, but I love the way Jesse talks about his relationship with the Lord. He says, he says, you know, I just, I just uh, wake up in the morning and I say, I say, hello, Jesus. And Jesus says, hello, Jesse. I say, well, you can't do that. Well, who says we can? You know, the tradition of man has got, you know, O oh, omnipotent God that sitteth upon the rim of thy universe and holdeth the glory of thy abundant riches. Yea, I come unto thee even as I come unto thee humble and... No, no. Hi, Jesus. Hi, Jesse. Come on. The Bible said he's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. You don't talk to your friend that way. Now, I will give honor and reverence. I just talked about that. But there's time where you just talk to the Lord. You know what that, that, that phrase in the scripture, pray without ceasing, you know what that really means? Just have a constant running conversation with the Lord. Just have a running conversation with the Lord. Something happens and you say, wow, well, I'm glad you saw that too. Well, you hear that? Or the enemy will whisper something in your, in your mind and I'll say, I'll say well, I turn that over to you, my lawyer. I, I just turn that over to my lawyer. I'll say, and and thank you, Lord. Thank you. I appreciate it, Lord. Thank you for giving me a great wife. Oh, the greatest wife in the world. I love her with all my heart. What a gift. Praise God. <laughs> thank you for giving me the greatest dog in the world. Notice which I put first. I, I did that right. I did that right. Thank you for giving me a great horse. Oh, I love my horse. I, I We were sitting out on the front porch the other day, and and Titan, our German shepherd, was lying there. And, and Walker, our little papillon, was lying there. And I'm looking at, I'm looking at Titan. I said, 
I said to Karen, I said, we need to get more pictures of him. I said, he's the perfect German shepherd. Look at that confirmation. And that dog is so anointed, he understands English. I was talking, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't he? I'm talking about the dog. I didn't call his name. I didn't change my name. He got up, walked over to me, and just propped his both paws up and looked at me and said, thank you, thank you, thank you. He didn't use English, but he, he yeah, I just, and, and I just talking to the Lord that way. Thank you, Lord, for my dog. Oh, I love my dog. Oh, Brother Mike, we need somebody more serious than that. Okay, thank you for my dog. We love our front porch. We, we got a, a front porch that looks across our yard into the woods, and every once in a while the deer will come out, you know, watch. And we'll sit out there and I have our early morning coffee, and I'll usually get up way before light, but we'll then, as the sun's coming up, we'll sit out there and have a little cup of early morning coffee together and just thank you, Lord. This is the day you've made. We get to walk with God. We get to walk with God. But you have to be submitted to God to resist the devil. Resistance without submission is like lighting a fuse that isn't attached to any gunpowder. Come on, think about that. Resisting the devil without submitting to God is like lighting a fuse that isn't attached to any gunpowder. And a lot of people say, well, I resist the spirit of fear, but it won't go away. Well, how intimate are you with God? Stay intimate with God. Now, sometimes we men have a problem with that word, intimate with God. And Frank, I'll, I'll be honest with you. For a long time, I had a problem with that. In the sense because, I, oh, I'm going to get myself in trouble here, but that's nothing new. Now, don't, don't get mad at me now. And, uh, you know, women like certain worship songs, and men like certain worship songs, and we all ought to, understand each other and and worship together but but i i don't i don't it doesn't move me a lot now if this is your favorite song just keep breathing in and out it it doesn't move me a lot when they used to sing the song you know i i don't even remember it because i wanted to forget it it it, it wasn't it wasn't that it was non-biblical it just didn't appeal to my manhood you know and we're we're singing to jesus and they said I want to I wanna lay my heart on your breast or lay my ear on your breast and hear your heartbeat. Well, I know, that, I know that the Bible says John leaned on his breast, but what that meant was they were reclined on couches and he leaned over. I, I don't, as a man, I'm, 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 not, I'm, not, I'm not excited about that. I, honestly. I mean, I'd rather say, I'd rather strap up and get our swords and go fight together. Hallelujah. And so that word intimate, see what I'm saying? We men sometimes have trouble with that. To be intimate with God. To be intimate with Jesus. Well, you know, but, but guys, get over that. What it means is to just walk in close relationship with him. Walk together. Talk together. Fight the fight together. And, uh, and that's why if, if you're married, God's given you a, a wife to help you with that, that, you know. And that doesn't mean, well, men need to get in touch with their feminine side. I do. Her name is Karen. I get in touch with her every day. It's the only feminine side I have. Now, we won't get in there. Are you all right? When you're walking in close fellowship with God, fear begins to diminish. When you're walking in close fellowship with God, fear begins to diminish. Psalm 23, 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? You're with me. Why did he fear no evil? He's walking in intimacy with God. He said, I'm not going to fear evil. Why? You are with me. And your rod and your staff comfort me. Psalm 27, 1 through 3. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? 
even when the wicked, my enemies and my foes came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and they fell. Though an army or a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this I will be confident. How could it be that way? The Lord is my light. He's my salvation. He's the strength of my life. Oh, come on, somebody. I'm walking in intimacy with him, and I'm not going to fear. Psalm 46, 1 and 2. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Y'all are too Presbyterian tonight. Come on. I'm going to say it again. I love our Presbyterian brethren. <laughs> God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth be removed, even if the earth fell away, we'll not fear. If the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, we will not fear. Why? God is our refuge. <laughs> Hallelujah. And strength. Luke 12, 32. Fear not, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. We got a good, good father. I said we got a good, good father. I'm trying to stay teaching, but boy, there's some preaching this. Hebrews 13, 6. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. I'll not fear what man shall do unto me. If they go into a bat cave and get a virus and weaponize it. Hello? Testing one, two, three. I'll not fear it if they do that. I'll not fear if a nuclear bomb comes up. I was on a radio program, and it was a call-in program. We were answering Bible questions. And we were talking a lot about prophecy and the coming of the Lord and World War III that the Bible predicts very, very specifically in Ezekiel 37, 38, and 39. And uh, we were talking about that. And the Bible said there'll be a fire on every isle. And if there's no proper name given to an island, it means continent in the scripture, particularly in the Old Testament. So when it's said during this war, there will be a fire on every continent, it means that. And, uh, and a lady called in and she said, she said, Dr. Brown, and uh, she said, you mean to tell me that, that well, we're a continent? I said, yes, ma'am, we are and, uh, in North America. And she said, well, you mean there can be, you mean bombs could fall here? I said, yes, ma'am. I said, I mean that. And she said, well, you sound kind of uh, lackadaisical about it, kind of cavalier about it. She said, don't you know we can be blown up too? I said, well, ma'am, the key word is up. Blown up, called up, we're going up. And I said, now what good is it going to do to fear it? What good is it going to do to fear it? Well, Brother Mike, is that war going to start after the rapture or just before the rapture? Or is it going to be during the, the rapture, during the war? I don't know. We're not giving specifics about that necessarily so much. And a lot of people have opinions about Gog and Magog and so forth. But it doesn't matter to me why I'm walking in intimacy with God. God is with me. I'm not going to fear. I'm not going to fear. What's the worst they can do? Land a nuclear weapon on my head to be absent from the body is to be radioactively with the Lord. That was a paraphrase. 1 John chapter 4, 18 and 19 from the Amplified. Talking about, talking about love, casting out fear here. There is no fear in love. Dread does not exist, but full-grown, complete, perfect love turns fear out of doors. Anybody like that? You know, put the cat out. You know, put the... <laughs> I'm getting good interaction tonight. I said, put the cat out, and somebody said, let in the dogs. And <laughs> what, well, however you want to do it, you know. 
but put, put fear out of doors, and it expels every trace of terror. For fear brings with it the thought of punishment. And so he who is afraid has not reached the full maturity of love. That doesn't mean we ought to be condemning of ourselves or others. Just let's keep growing in love. Amen. And thereby is not yet grown into love's complete perfection. We love him because he first loved us. So we attack fear, secondly, by walking in intimacy with God. Number three, y'all still with me? We attack fear by praying in the Spirit. We attack fear by praying in the Spirit. Jude, verse 20, there's only one chapter, so Jude, chapter 1, verse 20. Beloved, building up yourself on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Now, if you don't have your prayer language in other tongues or unknown tongues, it doesn't mean you're an, inf an inferior Christian. But the Bible teaches that it is for all that are called afar off from the day of Pentecost. And when we're baptized in the Holy Spirit and he gives us our prayer language and we pray in the Spirit, the Bible said we build up our holy faith. As faith gets built, Fear gets diminished. Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27. So too, the Holy Spirit comes to our aid and bears us up in our weakness. For we do not know what prayer to offer. Anybody ever been there? I don't know what to pray about this. Nor how to offer it worthily as we ought. But the Spirit himself goes to meet our supplication. This amplified too goes to meet our supplication and pleads in our behalf with unspeakable yearnings and groanings too deep for utterance. And he who searches the hearts of men know what is the mind of the Holy Spirit, what his intent is, because the Spirit intercedes and pleads before God in behalf of the saints, watch this, according to the will of God, and in harmony with the will of God. Amen. Boy, isn't that good? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We pray to the Father with our request. But the Bible says we pray in the name of Jesus, through the Son. But now think of this. The Holy Spirit is praying through Jesus to the Father, so you've got, and nobody can fully understand the Trinity. I know we all think we do, but we don't. No need to worry about it. Just, just take it by faith. Yeah, I know, egg. I know, yolk, white, shell. Scramble it. It doesn't explain the Trinity. I mean, and I've, got, I've got things I can give you too, but just take that by faith. But according to this verse, you've got God the Holy Spirit praying through God the Son to God the Father according to and in perfect harmony with the will of God. When? When you're praying in the Spirit. Woo! Now, come on. If you've got God the Holy Spirit praying for you here, and the book of Hebrews says Jesus is interceding for you there, you've got God praying through God to God, and the Bible said if two or three agree... As such in anything on the earth. <laughs> Glory to God. And he prays according to the will of God. So we attack fear by praying in the spirit. Number four. We attack fear by walking with word people of faith. Walk with word people. That have faith. When fear comes into your heart. Don't get around other people that are scared out of their minds. It's okay to be around them and to love them and to minister to them. But dear God, my Lord, man, what you magnify gets bigger. Don't get around people all the time that are afraid of this or afraid of that. 1 Corinthians 15, in the Amplified. Do not be deceived or misled. Evil companionship, communion associations, corrupt and depraved good manners and morals and character. Just some words that say this. You get with the wrong people, you get the wrong results. 
I've got about a five or six CD set on the law of association. God has more to say about people not to let in your inner circle than he says about people to let in your inner circle. And, and, and it doesn't even mean that they're evil people necessarily in this fear thing, but they may be gripped by fear. And if they're gripped by fear and fear is attacking you, you need to find somebody that is operating in the spirit of faith. There's a spirit of fear. There's a spirit of faith. And you need to find people when you're afraid. And all of us face that at one time or another. And, but you need to get around people that will encourage your faith. Amen. Encourage your faith. Not, don't, don't get around people that feed your fear. Feed your fear. That's why I tell you, limit the news. Well, I tell you, limit the news. Well, Brother Mike, that's none of your business. Well, you're my business. I'm a shepherd of a flock, and I'm trying to help you here. Limit the news. I'm not telling you to, to not watch any of it. Get what you need. But you don't need to hear the same story over and over and over. And the same statistics, whether it be about inflation, whether it be about gas prices, whether it be about riots in the streets, whether it about, be about murder going up, whether it be about COVID, whether it be about China, you don't have to. If you live on that all the time, it gets bigger, it gets bigger, it gets bigger, it gets bigger. Get with, get with people that say, well, that may be the fact, but the truth is our God reigns. He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or even think. Yeah, but, but, but you know, but Brother Mike, I'm afraid I'm going to die. I had somebody say that to me several months ago. They said, I'm afraid I'm going to die. I said, let me assure you, you will if the rapture doesn't happen. I said, so if you're going to, why be afraid of it? The Bible said in the book of Hebrews, we've been delivered from the fear of death. I said, we've been delivered from the fear of death. Hallelujah. My mom, before she went home, in her little apartment on our property there, just right up the driveway from our home, we wanted her to have her privacy, but we wanted her to be there so she could eat with us and we could help her, and it was a perfect arrangement. And uh, one day she had a vision. She had two visions. I've told you one, but I don't think I've told you this one. And she was seated on the couch, and she had a vision of her dad. She called her dad Pop, and uh, his name was Bennett. His last name was Bennett, and Henry Bennett, and he was about 6'1", 6'2", and he played the fiddle. Now, I would say he played the violin, but he's from Alton, Missouri, and they played the fiddle. They played the fiddle, and, uh, and Mom had a vision of Pop and said he was straight and tall and young, curly hair, like she remembered, and, and he was playing the fiddle, and he was playing this beautiful fiddle, and he got through with this beautiful song, and he held it down to his side, and he looked down at her, and he said, Fern, that's what it's like, this thing called death. You play the first verse here and the chorus here. And he disappeared. You play the verse there. And you play the chorus here. And you don't even miss a note. See? Well, you know, death is hard for us that are left. It leaves a vacuum in us. And uh, the Bible said, we sorrow not as those who have no hope. I've heard preachers use that and take it out of context, say, we sorrow not. That, no, no, no. We sorrow not as those who have no hope. Well, we don't mourn. Well, yeah, we do. Blessed are they that mourn, for they'll be comforted. And God understands that. Jesus wept at the tomb of Lazarus, and he knew he was going to raise him from the dead. But, we, but, but for those that have gone on to be with the Lord, there is no... Uh, my dad, dad wanted this in his funeral, and so we played it by, by Jake Hess. And I don't know if you've ever heard it, but I haven't heard it since then, but it, it's an old song. 
and it's just entitled, Death Ain't No Big Deal. And Dad loved that. He was an old warrior from World War II. And he just, he said, I want that play. And he said, I forget the verse, he said, the doctor will look down and look at me and say, you're dead. And, and he said, and he'd be surprised to know just how I feel that right now, death ain't no big deal. You know, we think it is, but when it comes time, now I don't want to go before time. Because I want to fulfill my assignment, amen. But the Bible says we've been delivered from the power of death. So don't get around people that are talking, you know, be afraid to die, be afraid to live, be afraid to do this, be afraid to do that, be afraid to invest, you might lose. Yeah, but you might not. Spirit of God will give you good ideas. Amen. Now, 1 Corinthians 5, 6 says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump which means you don't need to get a lot of people around you that are full of fear to get you into fear. Just a few. Remember what happened to an entire generation of Israel. They had seen the power of God deliver them from Egyptian slavery. They'd followed the very presence of God. Boy, I wish I could do that. The way Brother Kilpatrick did it the other night. We were together. I can't do it. God hasn't strengthened me to do it. I'd like to try it, but forget it. I, I, I'm going to get more lessons from it. But he, he kind of went, see, I can't do it. And, but he could, sound like, he could sound like a flame turns on. Have you ever heard a flame, a gas flame? That, that was better. You know, and, and that, that flame turns on. And I like the way he was describing Israel in the desert. He said, Every night after the sun went down, outside of their tents, they heard, and the flame came on. Can you imagine? I mean, these people saw ten plagues in Egypt that totally destroyed Egypt. They saw the Red Sea open up. They saw the Egyptian army drown. All day, the very presence of God was visible in the Shekinah cloud. And at night, that pillar of fire came on. And they got to the promised land. And they were afraid of giants. Giants. Egyptians was pretty much a giant empire. The Red Sea was pretty big and they had walked through the desert under the Shekinah and the every night and you know why they got afraid of giants in the land that they owned they owned it they the giants were trespassers you know why they got afraid they listened to 10 men it doesn't take many, just ten. They had seen, yeah, just one. They'd seen all the power of God. They'd seen the miracles, the Red Sea, the fire at night, the, the, the Shekinah by day, manna from heaven, water from a rock. This wasn't a water fountain, folks. This was enough to feed, uh, to, to quench the thirst of two million people plus the herds. They came out healthy from Egypt. They came out wealthy from Egypt. God had blessed them. And 12 men were sent in to check out the land. And 10 of them came back and said, We can't go in there. There's giants in the land. And we in our sight are like grasshoppers. And the whole bunch in that generation that had seen the glory of God listened to 10 losers. And they started crying all night. The Bible said the people lifted up their voice and they wept all night. And the next morning, they manifest stupid. They said, I would to God, we died in Egypt. It'd be best we stone Moses and go back to Egypt. Would to God. Then they said, would to God, we died in the wilderness. And God got fed up with it. 
And they said, would to God we died in the wilderness. And he said, according to your word, so it be unto you. He said, he said, I'll give you 40 years of answered prayer. There were two men that said, we're well able to go up and take the country. The song, I like it. We're well able to go up and take the country, to possess the land from Jordan to the sea. Though the giants may be there, our way to hinder. God will surely give us victory. Hallelujah. Who are the Caleb and the Joshua's in your life? You don't need people in your life telling you why you can't have what God says you can have and why you can't go where God says you can't go. And I, I'm out of teaching, but I'm preaching a little bit, and you need the preaching. Get away from those people. Love them, but love them long distance. Don't share with them your fears. They'll say, well, if you think that's bad, let me tell you how bad it really is. No, man. I want somebody speaking in my life. You're going to make it. You're more than a conqueror. No weapon formed against you will prosper. I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. If I'm for you, nobody can be against you. There is therefore now no condemnation. You're able to go up and take the country. You have no fear of death. God is with you. Hallelujah. Come on. Get somebody in your life that will keep blessing you that way. Remember the example of David's men? 1 Samuel 22, 2. How'd you like to have this group? Everyone that was in distress. Everyone that was in debt. <laughs> everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto David. And he became a captain over them. And there were with him about 400 men. You say, well, Brother Mike, why'd you give that? That's, that's how they showed up. They were discontented. They were distressed. They were in debt. They were a mess. But they hooked up with David. Come on, somebody. And if you keep reading in that book, pretty, pretty soon you know who they were called. They, were saying, yeah, they had another phrase for these guys. They weren't the in debt men. They weren't the in distress men. They weren't the discontented men. They were the mighty men of David. And you begin to read what they did. Just a few things like one guy went down to Egypt and killed a lion in a pit with a stick in the snow. <laughs> Another one stood in a pea patch and fought off an army with his sword by himself. They got so strong they wouldn't let David kill Goliath's brothers. They went and did it. How did they start off? Afraid, discontented, in debt, in distress. What made the difference? They hooked up with a lion. Who you're with matters, brother. Come on, somebody. Alexander the Great made this statement. He said, I'm not afraid of an army of lions if it's led by a sheep. But he said, I am afraid of an army of sheep if it's led by a lion. And guess what? We're the sheep of his pasture, and we're led by the lion of the tribe of Judah. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, folks, just uh, link up with folk that are going to encourage your faith Amen. and bless you. Number five, I'm really trying to finish this night. Think I'll make it? Well, that was a mixed multitude right there, huh? Number five, attack fear by doing what you fear. Now, listen real careful to what I'm going to say, or you'll go out and do something silly. When in faith and wisdom, and I'm not talking about the name of our church, I'm talking about operating in faith and operating in wisdom, you do what you fear, you conquer that fear. Now, notice I said in faith and wisdom. Not foolishness and presumption. Some fear can be God's wisdom. So what do you mean? Well, <laughs> if you reach, I, I used this illustration the other day. If I'm reaching down and clearing brush, and I'm getting ready to grab a hold of a piece of brush, pull it out of there, and I hear... <laughs> 
there's a shot of adrenaline that goes through me. And my natural response is to, yes, I'll give him space. Well, I thought you had no fear. Yeah, but, but my heavenly father didn't raise any fools. He put the rattles on to tell me. Back away. Now, I have another response called, <laughs> Hello. I'll get letters on that one. But you, you understand what I'm saying? I, I'm, I'm not talking about foolishness and presumption. You know, well, <laughs> they shall take up serpents and they shall not harm them. That doesn't mean you're going to be goofy enough to go out and find poisonous snakes and bring it into the church. And hold them up. And thank God most of that's gone. I guess in few places they do that. Wendy Bagwell used to have a story about that. He said they went into a church in a certain state. And they started doing that. And they brought out some rattlesnakes. And, and Wendy just <laughs> looked at the guy playing bass for him. And he said, where's the back door? And he said, they don't have a back door. And Wendy said, reckon where they want one. <laughs> You say, well, Wendy's operating in fear. No, Wendy's operating in wisdom. The guy up there handling the thing. It meant if you, if you're bitten by a Paul was bitten by one, shook it off in the fire. He said, if you drink any deadly thing, it shall not harm you. Now, that doesn't mean, well, if you're afraid of arsenic, go drink some, you'll conquer the fear. How stupid that would be. That's not what we're talking about. But, but there is a truth here. Now, did you all get my official disclaimer? When I say do what you fear to conquer the fear, that doesn't mean if you, conquer, if, if you have a fear of heights, go up on a tall building and jump off. No. Okay? But there is some truth in this. If I fear water, I'll never get over it unless under right supervision and help, I'm able to wade into it a little bit. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> Every time I think of that, I remember when my dad baptized that lady in a baptistry, and she was so afraid of water, but she wanted to be baptized. And she was a big lady. And dad was a pretty small guy. And he tried it three times. And I baptized him in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And started to put her down. And she grabbed both sides of the baptistry. I mean, it was a picture. <laughs> and, and Dad was a diplomat. He just, he, he said, now, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, our dear sister has a fear of water. But she wants to follow the Lord. And, and we're just going to pray for her. And, and uh, do you want to try again? Yes, yes, Pastor, I do. I want to be baptized. And so, all right, had her put her hand up, you know, like that over her mouth and like we do. And, and now I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. And, started, and she couldn't help it. She's scared of that. My dad, pretty sharp. And uh, she stood up and she's crying. He said, now, sister, don't be afraid of this. And, and don't, don't be ashamed. We know you have this fear, but. You're demonstrating great courage by being standing here in this baptistry, and we commend you for that. And uh, we know that you've been born again and saved. And he was just talking in a voice like this, and he said, he said, we know that you love Jesus, and the Lord has saved you, and we know that you want to be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Wow! Water came over both sides. I'm not kidding you, man. I'd stay, he's laughing at every now if the Lord let him watch this. And she came up, come up out of that water. She said, I did it, I did it, I did it. I knew what my dad was thinking, and I lived, I lived, I lived. Well, she had to, had to do something. I had a lady in, in our church when I pastored, uh, when, when Karen and I pastored down in South Texas. And she was deathly afraid of spiders. What is that? Arachnophobia. I believe it's called arachnophobia. And it's a real deal. She was deathly afraid of spiders. And uh, she came to me and she said, you know, she told me about it. And so we prayed over, believed God, and taught her about anti-fear and so forth. And one, one, 
one Wednesday, I think it was, she went down in, in, in one of the corners of one of the rooms of the church, and we kept it clean, but she found a spider. And somehow she caught that thing or had somebody catch it and brought it to me. And she said, I want you to pray again that I don't have fear of this thing. And I prayed over her. And she said, all right, I believe I received that in Jesus' name. And reached up, grabbed hold of that spider, grabbed hold of that spider and went. <laughs> like that, opened her hand, said, take that. <laughs> Throw it off. Well, now she did that under supervision, and it wasn't a black widow. But you see what I'm saying? Sometimes you have to do what you fear. People are afraid of flying. You never get over it unless you fly a little bit. You got to fly a little bit. And, 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 and Brother Ron will take you up. He'll charter a plane and pay for it himself, and he'll take you up and pray in tongues while he... No, he won't. But uh, y'all still here? Uh, I, the only fear I have is technology doing stuff to me, and it does it all the time. I don't really fear it, but it irritates me. Um, it just went back to the beginning. Y'all want to start this whole series over again? Let's see. Uh, by doing what you fear. I'm going to skip a bunch of this. I want to give you six and seven real quick. Number six, attack fear with the Word of God. Attack fear with the Word of God. We've already seen that God's Word is the major source of faith. It's also the greatest attack, attack weapon against fear. Most of the armor mentioned in Ephesians 6 is defensive, but God's Word is the sword of the Spirit. That's offensive. God's Word has the power to dispel fear, but that power is only activated when it's spoken in faith. Just, just as believing that Jesus is the resurrected Son of God has the power to save a person. I wrote this. I'm just reading it to you. But it is only activated by confessing it with your mouth. So Scripture has the power to conquer fear, but it won't conquer it at all until you speak it with your mouth in faith. As long as the sword remains in the scabbard, it's not going to do any cutting. Faith triumphing over fear is activated when you speak God's word to the fear in faith. Romans 10, 8. What saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth. Where is it? In thy mouth. Say that with me. In my mouth, say it again, in my mouth and in my heart, what is it? That is the word of faith, which we preach. You've got to speak it. Do you see what I said in that, in that illustration or what I just read to you? The power of God, the power of the word of God, believing that Jesus is the son of God, that he died and rose from the dead. Believing has the power to save you. Can I get an amen? Will doing that alone save you? No. That if thou shalt confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. The power of life and death is in the tongue. I don't have time, and I'll teach it another time in depth. But Mark eleven twenty three 23 is the key scripture of this thing. Jesus is going in. He sees a fig tree. He's hungry. And there is no figs on it. And he said, let no man eat fruit thereof forever. And they came back the next day, and Peter says, and the disciples said, look at there. It, something obeyed you. Look at there. That fig tree's dried up. And Jesus didn't say anything about the fig tree. He just said, yeah. He said, if you'll speak, if you'll speak. Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. A greater translation is have the God kind of faith. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain be removed, be cast into the sea. Don't doubt in your heart. Believe the things which you say shall come to pass. He'll have what he says. You got to say stuff, folks. 
How is it we talk about everything except faith? Come on. We ought to be talking faith. Well, you, but sometime I'm going to die and go and be with the Lord. Well, of course you are. When it's your time to go, you'll go. But we're talking faith. Let me give you these keys. You have the power to release the life of the word or the death of fear by your tongue. You have, the, you have to move the word from your heart out of your mouth. Nothing will move until you speak to it. And you cannot speak in doubt and be successful. I'll teach that more in depth later. Number seven. I'm going to get it done. Number seven. Attack fear by being proactive in bringing fear rather than receiving fear. Come on, I want you to get a hold of this. Start being a fear transmitter rather than being a fear receiver. Why do you have to be the receiver of fear? Put out some fear of your own. Now, there you go, Brother Mike, getting violent. Yeah, well, the kingdom of heaven alloweth violence and the violent take it by force. Not talking about physical violence. But you're going to have to put some fear in the heart of the enemy. Well, I can't make him afraid. Well, not talking that way. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Huh? Resist the devil, he'll flee from you. What, you mean God will make me powerful enough to bring fear to the enemy of my soul, to demonic spirits, that I could actually bring fear? To the enemies of my soul, demonic spirits. Well, Deuteronomy 2.25. This day will I begin to put the dread of you and the fear of you upon the nations <laughs> that are under the whole heaven who shall hear the report of you and they will tremble and they'll be in anguish because of you. Glory to God. Now, some of you are so sweet, i got to sour you up a little bit. Quit being just a fear receiver. Be a fear transmitter. The devil says, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Some of you need to kind of get this attitude. Well, in the name of Jesus, if you feel froggy, start jumping. Some of you whine and whimper, stop it. You are armed. You are dangerous. You have a helmet of salvation and a breastplate of righteousness and a belt of truth and combat boots of peace and a shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit and the lance of prayer and the greater one lives in you, bless God. And the Bible said you will tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the devil and nothing shall by any means harm you. So quit whining and start roaring a little bit. Greatest power on the earth is the church of the living God. And we're hiding away, scared of our shadows. Bless God out of this last time. I'm not just talking about COVID. I'm talking about all the junk that's going on around. I, I may, I'll tell you something that I believe with all of my heart. That out of this thing, there's going to rise a remnant church that's on fire with the glory of God that doesn't want to play church anymore, that doesn't have any fear and believes in signs and wonders and miracles and evangelism and FWC going to be in the middle of it. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, praise team, come up here. We're going to end this thing by singing a song. Whoo, if I can calm down enough to sing. Glory to God. I wish somebody would shout a little bit in the house. Well, glory to God. Tell you, well, folks, we don't have to live in fear. We don't have to live in fear. Now, I'm going to give you one more key to this. How many think that Jesus lived in fear or lived above fear? How many think that he lived in faith above fear? Now, I believe that in the Garden of Gethsemane, I believe that fear tried to grip his heart in the garden. Why? Because he had to be tempted in all points like we are. And he cried out to God and he said, if there be any other way, 
let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. I believe he experienced great fear at that moment. But he conquered that fear. How do you know he conquered it? Because he went on to the cross. He could have stopped it at any time. But he lived strong above fear. I don't know why, but I thought of this song. I haven't thought of it in years, and I thought of it today. As I was praying for people that are ill, praying for people that are going through tests and trials and a lot of different things attacking them. And uh, the Lord spoke to me and he said, you know, if you just, if my people would just let me be Jesus in them. He said, if, if, if you just let me be who I am in you. Not you. Me. And it reminded me of this song. And we're going to sing it, and then you'll catch on to it. It's real simple. And I want us to worship the Lord with it. Well, Jesus, be Jesus in me. Stand to your feet and sing it as a prayer. Well, Jesus, be Jesus in me. you that'll conquer fear in your life I said that'll conquer fear in your life I said that'll conquer fear in your life resurrection power fill me this hour <laughs> how did he keep going how did he go all the way to the cross how did he say it is finished how did he make it how did he conquer all of that fear well it's because he was Jesus and Jesus is Jesus in you so the greater one is in you come on say it out loud with me the greater one is in me those of you watching in our online family say it out loud wherever you are the greater one is in me say it again the greater one 
is in me. The third time. The greater one is in me. Will Jesus be Jesus in me? Brother Hagin used to say, I'll tell it to you and then we'll, we'll go. Did you all receive this tonight? Seven ways to attack your fear. Seven ways to attack your fear. And every one of them will work. And use them all. Seven is a perfect number. And you attack it with all seven. But, but Brother Hagin used to say, he said, you know, he said, if you'll put on the whole armor of God, and put on the helmet of salvation and close the visor and speak God's word. Demons won't know if it's you or Jesus in there. <laughs> Woo! Lord, I like that. My God, that's good, isn't it? Woo! That'd make an Egyptian mummy want to shout and dance in the spirit. Glory to God. I think I'll say it one more time. He said, he said, if you put the whole armor of God on and put the helmet of salvation on and close the visor. That's what John the Baptist was doing. He said, I must decrease. He's closing the visor. I'll close the visor and let him in me increase. And he said, and if you'll just speak the word of God, don't speak your, speak the word of God. He said, demons that come against you won't know if it's you or Jesus that they're speaking. That'll put some anxiety in them, I guarantee you. Well, glory to God. Well, uh, we're going to package this series. We're pretty soon going to package all of our series that I've taught. And uh, they'll be out in our resource center that's going to be greatly expanded. Our books are going to be out there and other people's books. And we're going to expand. He said, well, Brother Mike, we better, better back up a little bit. You know, there's trouble all around. Yeah, we're going to run right through it, too. We're going to run right through it. We're going to run right over it. We're not going to get off mission. We're not going to back down. Not going to be afraid. We're going to walk together. We're going to stay in love with one another and be kind to one another. And we're going to win people to Jesus. Praise God. I bless you all in the name of Jesus. I bless you. I bless you. I thank God for you. And I receive your blessing back. Hallelujah. You're blessed in the city. You're blessed in the field. You're blessed when you rise up. You're blessed when you lie down. You're blessed when you come in and when you go out. You're, you're blessed in the fruit of your body and in the work of your hands. And, and your baskets are full and your storehouses are full. And you're above only and not beneath. And when your enemy comes against you one way, he's going to flee from you seven ways. And you're the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. And you'll lend to many nations and not borrow. Hallelujah. Glory to God. God bless you.